Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, March 25th, and it is tea time with me, Captain Awesome of Cape Cod Learning Tours, a hands-on marine science tour company based in uh, Sandwich on Cape Cod. Uh, we work with uh, tourists and locals and hotels and schools and trying to teach as many people as possible about this amazing uh, place we call Cape Cod. Uh, while we have this ongoing issue occurring with um, the COVID-19 or coronavirus, Every day from uh, 2 to 2.30ish, I'll be giving a presentation or taking you on a virtual hike or walk out to try to um, keep your mind engaged and uh, um, hopefully um, teach you a little bit of stuff. So uh, jump right into it. Today we're going to talk about the horseshoe crab, uh, which is not actually a crab. Thus the title of the um, presentation, Is It a Spider or Is It a Crab? And in fact, hmm, let's get to it. Hold on, hold on. There we go. So, this is a small horseshoe crab. This is one we caught in the marsh of um, uh, Old Silver Beach over by the um, uh, Seacrest Hotel. Uh, we found it kind of down in the sand, and believe it or not, this horseshoe crab is actually a couple of years old. Um, horseshoe crabs, when they hatch out of an egg, are barely bigger than a grain of rice. We will almost never find them that small unless we happen to be there when they are hatching. Um, this is an adult. Uh, this picture was taken at the uh, Marine Biological Laboratory tank. Uh, that's why it's so clear. The water is super clean. Um, but there you get a really good look at one of its compound eyes and, and the basic shape of it. So lots of people come to Cape Cod in the summertime and they see horseshoe crabs and they think that they are dangerous. Um, most people think that they take that tail and uh, point it up into the air as a protective measure. As you'll find soon, they are completely harmless animals. Uh, they were around millions and millions of years um, between human beings, uh, before human beings even existed. So they don't really have a defense that they geared against human beings. And in fact, their tail is not used for defense at all. It's used for swimming. When they're young, they swim upside down in the water, and so they use that tail as a rudder and a guide. As a matter of fact, when we're searching for horseshoe crabs in the summertime to show folks how cool they are, uh, one of the things we look for, because you generally don't see the entire animal, is the shape of the indentation of where the tail um, meets the, um, the thorax. And this is one uh, that <clears throat> I took a picture of down in Chatham. This is an older male. It obviously hasn't molted in a while. This is the type of horseshoe crab that most of you are going to encounter when you're on the beaches uh, here on Cape Cod. Uh, it's a pretty good, uh, neat looking animal. Um, these little critters that you see on top of it, growing on top of it, are slipper snails. And they've taken advantage of the fact that he moves around. It's an easy way for them to spread and also to get some food. Again, they come in from very small to rather large and a very harmless. Uh, you don't have to worry about them. As a matter of fact, you are more of a danger to them than they are to you for sure. There's four species of horseshoe crabs currently um, alive in the world. The first is the mangrove horseshoe crab found in South and Southeast Asia. And then there's ours. Our species is the Atlantic or American horseshoe crab, also known as Limulus polyphemus. This is what ours looks like. It has this large um, prosoma, also known as or its shell. And it's got a bit of a thorax, and then it's got the tail or the telson, T-E-L. S O N. Lots of interesting things anatomically about the horseshoe crab. 
Uh, it has uh, as many as nine eyes. Some scientists think that it may have more. Uh, we're generally uh, conversant with the two big ones that we see, but there's a number of small ones also scattered around. It also has blue blood. Mm, we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Um, there's also the Indian or Southern horseshoe crab and the Japanese or tri-spine horseshoe crab. The interesting thing is that all of these horseshoe crabs look exactly the same. The only way that we really know that they're different species is because we've been able to do genetic testing and determine that they have a different genetic structure. And that means that they can't interbreed. Um, so they are distinct species. Couple of things, we don't eat them here, but in Asia they are eaten in some parts. Personally, after handling hundreds if not thousands of horseshoe crabs in my career, I cannot imagine what part of the horseshoe crab you would eat. They're almost all shell. There's not a lot um, to them. So there's three amazing things that we're going to talk about today about, about the horseshoe crabs. Three. One is their age. Um, hold on, I have a question coming in from uh, Miss Lindsay. Lindsay, horseshoe crabs don't really, the way that they defend themselves is by getting big. Um, they don't have any natural predators that we know of. Their shell is very, very hard, and everything that's in them is down facing. So the one thing their tail is used for is to flip themselves over if they get tossed in the surf. Um, there's two kinds of shells that you'll find for horseshoe crabs. Um, one is a really lightweight um, shell that has all of the legs and all of the gills intact. That is, in fact, a molt of a horseshoe crab. That horseshoe crab is still alive out walking around. It has an exoskeleton. So when it gets too big for the skeleton that it's in, it splits the front of its shell, crawls out, and hardens a new shell. And that old shell uh, washes up on the beach. That horseshoe crab is still alive. The other type of horseshoe crab shell that you find is just the outer shell and all the legs and the gills are, are not in that anymore. Generally, that's one that has been flipped upside down in the surf and the seagulls have eaten it. Other than flipping upside down in the surf, they do not have any natural predators besides us. Um, we are kind of the uh, natural predator of almost everything. Horseshoe crab, so this is from Michaela from the Cape. Uh, they do not bite. One of the things that we do talk about when we find a live horseshoe crab is they look really uh, fierce and mean because they're prehistoric. When we look at the anatomy of one, if you turn it upside down, you'll see that it has little bristles in the center of its mouth and they look really firm and tough and, and sharp, but they're actually very soft. Um, I have handled many of them, put them on my head, put my hand up to them, they do not bite. Again, they are a completely harmless animal. Um, so we have their age that we're going to talk about, their blood. Their blood is one of the most important things medicinally that we have going for us right now, and we'll talk about that more in depth. And third, their breeding. They have an amazing way of breeding. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about those three things, and then we'll talk about another couple of things um, as well. First, their age. So, this is the earliest dinosaur that we have found. It is the Naya, Nyasasaurus. It was around 243 million years ago. Okay? 243 million years ago. The horseshoe crab were here 200 million years before dinosaurs. When the first dinosaur came about, Horseshoe crabs had already been here for 200 million years, virtually unchained, changed. These are two horseshoe crab fossils, and you will see that they look almost exactly like horseshoe crabs look today. There are some scientists who believe that 
horseshoe crabs are a perfectly evolved animal because they haven't changed in hundreds of millions of years. They've survived mass extinctions. They survived the asteroid strike that wiped out 99% of all the life on the planet. They have no uh, natural predators. They breed in such a way that if um, something disastrous were to happen to humanity, because we are their biggest danger right now, they would be able to recover um, fairly quickly. So they've been around for about 450 million years. That's an incredible long time. And in fact, it is considered to be one of the few animals that are a living fossil. Um, and we have them very commonly on the Cape in the summer, and we're very, very lucky to be able to do that. So they're one of the oldest living organisms as a species on the planet. The second thing is their blood, okay? I'm going to tell you a very quick story about Susie. Susie got sick, and Susie had to go to the hospital. The doctors weren't sure what was wrong with her, but they thought it was something bad. So they took a little blood out of Susie, and then they took that blood and shook it up, and put a little bit in a rabbit's ear. This is a way that they used to test some of the stuff kind of way back. So when they put that stuff in the rabbit's ear, a couple of days later, that rabbit died. A couple of days later, Susie died. But they were able to save the lady that was in the room with Susie. The rabbit dying indicated that she had a gram-negative bacteria uh, infection. Now, remember that I'm a naturalist. That's an IST with the least amount of education. So I know that the gram-negative bacteria is a very bad infection, but I can't tell you why. What I can tell you is that a horseshoe crab has a uh, chemical in its blood called limulus amoebocyte lysate. Okay, amoeba limulus amoebocyte lysate. The name comes from three things. Limulus, because the horseshoe crab's Latin name is limulus polyphemus. Amoebocyte, because the um, thing that detects bacteria is irregularly shaped like an amoeba. And lysate, because the Greek word for, for explosion is lice. You have a lice in your house probably. It's called Lysol. So they're looking at Lysol, um, so it becomes Lysate. That means that it makes a cell explode. It makes the cell explode, okay? So the irregularly shaped cells from the horseshoe crab make the uh, gram-negative bacterias explode. So what happens is they take a little bit of blood from the person and they expose it to the LAL and it immediately clots. Boop! Looks like uh, like jello. And they know that that person has a gram-negative bacteria and then they can start um, the medicine trial that will help to save that person's life. It is also used to test medicines for bacteria. It's used to test medical supplies for bacteria. In fact, anything that you've had go into your body medically or your grandparents or your parents or anybody that's had anything go into their body medically, it has probably been tested with horseshoe crab blood, LAL. It's hard to put a number on how many lives that has saved hundreds of thousands at the very least. It could potentially be um, millions. There is a small problem though, and that's how we get the blood from the horseshoe crabs. So horseshoe crabs have an interesting circulatory system. They have this really long, skinny heart. And it stretches across two parts of the horseshoe crab's body. And where that hinges in the middle is a little piece of um, ligament or tendon on the outside of the shell. So they're able to fairly easily bend the horseshoe crab and then put a needle in there and extract the blood. 
and then they let that blood drip into a jar. Now, the jar that you see pictured is half full. Not all of that blood came from a horseshoe crab. There's not much blood in a horseshoe crab. But this is the only way. Um, Miss Lindsay, prescriptions do not have horseshoe blood in them, but when they do a batch of medicine, what they will do is kind of test it with the LAL to make sure that there's no bacteria. They take a little sample out and then they test it to make sure that it's not um, contaminated. So they use horseshoe blood to test the, the um, prescriptions, but they don't have any, they don't have horseshoe blood in them. Okay. So it takes a lot of horseshoe crabs in order to fill that jar. And because it's so um, valuable for saving lives and it's so intensive to collect the blood and you've got to collect the horseshoe crabs, um, it becomes very expensive. In fact, a jar of horseshoe crab blood, uh, a gallon, costs about $60,000, making it one of the most valuable items that we get um, from an animal. One of the side effects of this is that there is a mortality rate attached to drawing blood. Sometimes they can get an infection, sometimes the, the needle goes wrong, and so there are a small amount of horseshoe crabs that do die during this process. So, one of the things we have to do is figure out, is that, you know, worth it? The problem, so I'm a, I'm a tree-hugging liberal hippie. I have a company that teaches people about how amazing and awesome the natural world is at the same time I have a son who had some difficulties and had to go get a lot of medicine and I'm thankful that we had something that was able to test that so that my son didn't get an infection and die so we have to have that balance um, the thing that the thing about the horseshoe crab blood drawing is that they'll draw the blood and then they'll put a little notch in the shell and then they'll release the horseshoe crabs way out in the continental shelf where they spend most of their time anyway. So we're taking it away from the local waters after they've laid their eggs and bringing them back to where they spend most of the year. That actually protects them because another thing that horseshoe crabs are used for is bait and, and conch traps. If you're Italian or have some Italian friends and you've ever eaten scongili, scongili is a whelk or a conch uh, that's been thinly pounded and cooked up. And they love to eat horseshoe crabs. So there are fishermen who go out and collect horseshoe crabs, chop them up, put them in their traps, and use them for whelks. The scientists returning them out to the um, uh, continental shelf keeps that from happening. Uh, I would highly recommend, there are a couple of, of, of interesting stories on horseshoe crab blood online. I think there's one that was done by the BBC and one done by PBS. Uh, I would definitely uh, recommend checking them out and seeing how important um, this stuff is. Okay. Lastly is their breeding. And we'll talk a, a little bit more, some more stuff in just a few minutes, but I want to talk about their breeding because this is an amazing thing that they do. Okay. Talk first, a little off track, about a bird called a red knot. Isn't that a pretty bird? It's a pretty, pretty bird. I love that bird. I think it's amazing. We see them here every once in a while as they're going on um, their uh, annual migration. Uh, Alan Bishop, yes, uh, horseshoe crabs do migrate, but not up and down the coast. What horseshoe crabs do is go out to the continental shelf and then come in to breed and then go back to the continental shelf. Uh, so they travel about 200 miles to come in and breed because they need very special conditions um, to breed. So back to the red knot. I'm going to show you something. I went on a long hike the other day. It was like two miles. I was tired. Didn't like it. I do enjoy hiking, but it's the end of the winter and it's a little cold out. Didn't like it. This bird flies from Tierra del Fuego to the breeding grounds in the northern part of Canada, north of Hudson Bay. They go from almost the lowest point of the southern hemisphere to almost the highest point of the northern hemisphere. That is an incredibly, incredibly long migration. And the region we're seeing, Delaware Bay, 
is because that's where they stop. And they have timed their migration to be in Delaware Bay exactly when the horseshoe crabs are in Delaware Bay breeding. By the time the red knot gets to Delaware Bay, the red knot has lost 75% of its body weight. Okay, I'm a 200 pound guy. That means that I would weigh 50 pounds. And in order for them to continue their migration up to where they need to breed, they need to consume a huge amount of food and a lot of calories. And the horseshoe crabs lay these eggs, little green eggs, by the millions and the billions. These red knots gather in huge flocks on the Delaware coast because the horseshoe crabs breed and lay millions and 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 millions of eggs on the beach. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about more about that, but first we're going to go back to a little anatomy with the horseshoe crab. It is possible to tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab with one kind of easy side. When they become big enough to be sexually uh, reproductive, the male gets this front claw that looks like a little boxing glove with a hook, okay? The females keep a front claw that looks like pincers. <laughs> so, um, so Jamie, I think that's an interesting comment. I, I love that you've been uh, swimming in Delaware Bay. That is their largest breeding ground uh, on the Atlantic coast for sure, again, which is why the red knots stop there. Large sandy beaches, tens of miles of it, okay? So female, pincers on the front, male, boxing glove with a hook. And the male has this boxing glove with a hook because what he does is grab onto a female. And the female's gonna lay eggs and the male wants to deposit sperm onto those eggs. So he takes those hooks and grabs onto the female's um, shell and will not let go. It's like a high school senior at the prom. He's got her, he's not gonna let her go. Who knows what's gonna happen? He's hopeful, right? So that's the male. Um, when the female starts to lay eggs, the male will deposit his sperm. Now, sometimes there'll be two or three males attached to the female, and they will all um, put their sperm out there, and a few um, might be able to fertilize the eggs. But the ones that are closest have the best shot. Interesting thing, when you're out there, uh, males get to be about this big around, and they kind of stop growing because males carry sperm, and sperm are very, very, very small, so they don't need a lot of storage space. Females get bigger and bigger and bigger because they carry eggs, and in order to produce more eggs, you have to create more storage space, so the females can get very large. We don't see um, really, really big anymore. Um, so Paulette, uh, you are correct. There is this general feeling that we're not seeing as many horseshoe crabs now as we used to. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we were talking about the harvesting of the blood. And so when they harvest the blood, they bring them back out to the continental shelf. So they're not here as long as we expected to see them. Two, there may be a dip in the population. We're not sure. Um, Gil Newton, who is a naturalist who works for me, thinks that maybe horseshoe crabs might be uh, what he calls a um, a uh, a keystone species that if we start to look at them, you know they've lived in the ocean a long time. We know the ocean is starting to warm. The ocean's getting a little more acidic. They may be a species that we need to look at and watch in order to see what's happening in the ocean. Okay, um, so uh, gathering in Delaware, as some of you have said, look at that. Look at those thousands and thousands and millions of horseshoe crabs that wash up, that come up on the beach to lay their eggs. So what happens is they come up at the highest high tide, the full moon high tide. 
and they all lay their eggs in the sand. And then the tide goes out, and the tide won't be that high again until the next full moon. But the sand will still be damp where the horseshoe crabs lay their eggs. So they lay their eggs down in that damp sand, and over the next 30 days, the eggs grow. And at the next full moon high tide, when the water covers that sand, the eggs hatch and swim out into the water. Again, they are no bigger than a grain of rice. Um, it's a pretty amazing thing because each of those females can lay between 20 and 100,000 eggs. So if you multiply that number of eggs by the number of females, you get a huge amount of eggs, which is the reason why we think that these horseshoe crabs are able to survive through anything. Because if there's anything that kind of, let's say uh, tomorrow, we enacted laws that said people cannot harvest horseshoe crabs whatsoever. Can't get them, can't kill them, can't do anything with them and they were able to breed without any interruption for the next three years. They would boom in numbers if they were able, able to do that. Uh, side story about that. So we all know about fishing. Fishing is a big industry here. A lot of people rely on it. And we always are arguing about ground fish, uh, cod fish, things like that, and their stocks. One of the things we know for sure is that in World War II, we stopped fishing. People were afraid that they were going to be, you know, hit by a German submarine. So we stopped fishing. I think it was for like five years. And then when they went back and started fishing, the numbers of fish were incredibly huge. One of the things we've seen during this pandemic are images of the crystal clear waters of the Venetian canals, of uh, the lack of um, air pollution in certain areas. So we know that animals in the environment does have the ability to recover and rather quickly if we let it do that. I'm a proponent of that. I'm not sure how we would go about um, doing that. So this is uh, the end of my actual slides. But I wanted to talk to you about a couple of other things. The horseshoe crab has really neat eyes. And if any of you have ever seen um, the video of the woman who has a pair of glasses that she puts on and she hooks into her head and she can see because of the cameras on the glasses, that came about because of research that was done on the horseshoe crab compound eyes. Each lens in the compound eye has an individual nerve that goes to its brain. So they were able um, to uh, test the signal and then create those glasses that help blind people see. Also, if you get a chance, check out a, uh, a uh, video about how they're using horseshoe crab shells, which are made out of the same thing your fingernails and your hair is, um, keratin, for burn bandages, which reduce infections and reduce uh, the amount of scarring. They are an amazing, ancient animal. Once again, I'd like to thank all you guys for joining me for tea time. I've got my tea, and today, thanks to Alan Bishop, I've got cookies as well, so that's a pretty good thing. Um, we'll be back tomorrow. I'm not sure what we'll be doing tomorrow. If the weather's good, we might be outside. Otherwise, we'll be here. Uh, anybody has any questions? Uh, you can keep commenting on my uh, Facebook page, Cape Cod Learning Tours. And uh, please, I'd love it if you would subscribe to my Instagram, at Cape Cod Explorer. Uh, that's awesome, too. Good. I'm glad you guys uh, enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tell your friends about us, okay?